Oops, let me get the uh, advancer. Good to go? Yeah. All right, good morning and welcome to Risk Management Professionals, uh, SEMS. <laughs> Okay. All right. I think very good. Uh, first glitch of the morning. Okay. Welcome to Risk Management Professionals SEMS webinar series. Uh, this is part of our where we share our background in engineering activities associated with process safety management, risk management programs, and safety and environmental management systems SEMS uh, uh, to uh, other professionals who are dealing with these kind of issues. Uh, today we'll be focusing on the portion. As we get into this, you'll see the importance of it, and it's a critical element of the SIMS program. Uh, the key speakers today will be myself, Steve Marr, and also Matthias Bradel, uh, Carlos Chico, and I'll come in the concert period. Uh, but before we get started, um, let me go ahead and give you some logistics. Uh, this is an, a, an interactive, a live webinar. Uh, you will have the opportunity to do so you can also uh, use your chat window to contact our producer, Nicola Tromba. And Nicole, what is the caption on the uh, chat? Okay, RMP Corp is the contact point for the chat. Any questions or things Jack, go to our producer, Nicola Tromba. She'll go ahead and engines or um, or the if you do have technical problems, please also feel free to call. Our office number here, 949-282-0123. That's 949-282-0123, and somebody will be glad to help out. Um, this is, since this is a live interactive webinar, on your end, shuffling of papers, other meetings that you might be having, you don't want to you don't want to broadcast those either. So we've got all the participants on mute, but later on during the question and answer period, if you want to interject a question live or start a discussion, look at you and go ahead and uh, allow you to interject additional information. Uh, other other logistics, you've got a two images on your screen. Uh, it'll be a PowerPoint presentation that will be that Matthias and I will be going by. The other is a video image of the presenter. Uh, you can use the mouse to resize that video image and make it whatever ratio that you're comfortable with um, and, and however much you want to see of the presenter. So those are the key logistical items, so let's go ahead and get, get started. Um, again, welcome to uh, the webinar series, and today we'll be on hands analysis. The key topics that we'll be addressing are regulatory driving forces, comparing SIMs, for the offshore facilities to other safety management systems that are applied to both offshore, onshore uh, facilities and in other countries. Uh, we're going to look at the hazards analysis regulatory requirements, look at the various techniques, look at the evolution of protection systems and interface with other safety management systems, and also talk about other safety hazard analysis requirements. We also want to conclude with sharing with you effective ways to organize your SEMS program and a lot of tools and resources that are out there. So what I'd like to do is, again, our key objective is to share our information. Okay, we're going to go ahead and uh, go with some standby equipment holdings. I show on over here. Does it sound any better? All right. Uh, Michael, will you go log on your computer and see how it sounds on your end? And um, go ahead, and if we have bandwidth problems, I don't know if we're having bandwidth problems, but let's go ahead and proceed. Okay, is it is it audible? They can can they understand what's going on? Okay, very good. All right, sorry for the interruption, guys. Um, what I want to start with is talking about uh, how these various safety management systems evolved and the basis for the regulatory requirements. Uh, as for many things, um, how we got here is a function of some major tragedies that have occurred over the years. Um, thing, uh, things that uh, hit paper in 2010, it was Deepwater Horizon, the Piper Alpha event. 
hypopulmonia, all those things uh, tend to remind us as safety professionals how important it is the work that we're doing and, um, and also following best practices with respect to not only design, but also maintaining the degree of safety at our facilities. Okay, the, um, the key incidents that have been driving forces for these safety management system relations. On the screen, you're looking at a variety of incidents that have occurred over the past two decades. Uh, in 1984, Mexico City and Bhopal, India, especially the methyl isocyanate release in Bhopal, India, that resulted in over uh, 2,000 immediate fatalities, uh, really woke the world up to the potential for significant tragedies for large quantities of potentially hazardous materials that are, are handled by modern process facilities. As our, our modern lives get uh, more and more complex, the facilities that provide the chemicals and the energy that we need to make our modern life more comfortable also are, have, are harboring a lot of hazardous materials. It's really a matter of managing those. In 1984, those tragedies uh, formula, stimulated the formulation of the Center for Chemical Process Safety to the AICHE, which developed some guidelines for how to technically manage process safety. It's that manager that was a key focal point for causal events and what we're going to focus on today. Uh, the Piper Alpha event in 1988, the Texas City event in 2005, and the Deepwater Horizon spill in 2010, all those were pivotal events that resulted in the formulation of, of key regulations associated with safety management systems. So let's talk real briefly about the parallelisms between onshore and off offshore safety management system regulatory development. Um, when you look at all the major accidents that have occurred, it's real clear that they caused business interruption, lost confidence in contracts, increased regulation. When you look at the characteristics, you've got relatively simple precursors and initiates. Usually it's not a gap in fundamental understanding of laws of physics. It's not a gap in, in understanding the technology. But in most cases, the root cause of the events were the failure to maintain a design int intent which is your really for real first line of defense. If the engineering's done right, and if it's designed okay, maintaining the operation within the boundaries of safe operating limits is critical. So when you look at the most effective mechanisms for improvement, it's not really by addressing the specific or immediate causes of the event, but really by looking at the way business is done. This folds back into safety culture and management. It's those management systems are the key focal points and root causes of some of these major events, and that was really the, the that people wanted to address. When you look at the timeline of events that have occurred and what what car, what happened afterwards in terms of addressing them, when you're looking at onshore uh, safety management system applications and process safety management uh, in the United States, the um, 1984 events were really pivotal for waking people up to that. As I mentioned, the Center for Chemical Process Safety formed in 1987. I'm sorry, in 1985, and in 1987, they put out textbook guidelines for process safety. In 1990, API put out recommended practice 750. Those are also management guidelines for addressing process safety issues. Industry really jumped on the issue, understood the need, and put out technical guidance documents that were later used in 1992 by Federal OSHA to put together process safety management. And in 1996, as part of its duties under the Clean Air Act, the EPA put together risk management program regulations. So when you look at the timeline of events, it was really the tragedy of Bhopal Paul that really focused the attention on these issues. And I, I did have the honor of working on the CCPS Technical Steering Committee in the mid-80s. And one of the first things that we did is put together a management guidelines for how to manage the systems to stay within their safety boundaries. When you're looking at offshore uh, safety management systems, and we'll go to the bottom arrow first. When you're looking internationally, one of the key wake-up calls was the tragedy with Piper Alpha uh, in 1988. And right after that, there was the formulation of safety cases that we'll talk about a little bit later in the United Kingdom. And those were applied not only offshore, but also onshore facilities that were dealing with highly hazardous materials. Those are recently updated, and there have been a number of um, cases that have been put forth that provide good examples. 
when you're looking at onshore safety management systems in the U.S., um, there was a uh, platform safety shutdown system uh, work that I would be involved in in 1990 that looked at uh, three major types of offshore platform de designs from at that time analog protection systems to digital protection systems to help balance the degree of protection system with the, the potential hazard at the facility. That was also in response to some of these tragedies in Piper Alpha. When you're looking at um, industry response, API put together its safety environmental management program in 1991, uh, recommended the con at least the concept, the regu recommended practice itself was put together in 1993, updated in, 1990, in 2004, and the SEMS concept itself, a draft regulation in 2006, and a proposed rule in 2009. But it wasn't really until the Deepwater Horizon event in 2010 that the SEMS final rule that published that October with a November 15, 2011 due date really moved forward. So what you're looking for, whether you're looking at what you're looking at, whether it be uh, onshore process safety in the United States, offshore safety management systems in the United States, or offshore safety management systems globally, you're looking at key tragedies that have precipitated regulations. So when you compare the different regulations, we're focusing on SEMS today, but let's take a look at the other safety management systems. First, SEMS. The general provisions of this, safety and environmental management systems, hazards analysis, management of change, operating procedures, safe work practices, training, mechanical integrity, pre-startup reviews, emergency response and control, uh, auditing, investigation of incidents, and also documentation, all revolve around managing safety at the facility. Uh, the items in red, hazards analysis, management of change, operating procedures, and mechanical integrity, were four key areas that were put in the initial draft of this in 2006, and also they're recognized by process safety specialists as key events that people have been cited for before, key events that have been pivotal towards maintaining safety of facilities, and also key events that have resulted in problems at, at facilities and also other accidents. When you look at the other programs that are out there, process safety management, risk management programs, uh, when you compare them to SEMS, most of these key management system elements are overlapping. And when you compare it on the next slide to the the list of the events of the of the key elements of SIMS talked about, and also the different regulatory requirements. The second column there is SEMS, third column is OSHA's PSM, and fourth column is risk management programs. You're really looking at almost a one-to-one -one correspondence. So this is not this is not a coincidence. If these common these basic elements that for all practical purposes are very similar to the ones that were put together in that safety management systems guidance document that was put out by the CCPS in 1987. When you look at that, and here we are uh, 24 years later, the changes are not that significant. The same kind of key management system elements that were important back then are also very important right now. So let's talk about some of the regulatory requirements for hazards analysis. Uh, I went over the key elements for SEMS. Uh, again, one of the key elements and one of the most important ones that we're going to focus on today are hazards analysis. It's those requirements, how to address them and how to address them effectively, that's the focus of our topic. So let's look at the key objectives of hazards analysis from its, its origin for offshore for the United States, which is recommended practice 75. The key objectives of the hazards analysis are to identify hazards, evaluate them, look at control mechanisms, look at potential human factors issues, and based on various, we're using various analytical techniques that are provided in recommended practice 14J that match the tool to the facility complexity and risk, basically put together and formulate a good hazards analysis using a team that's composed of representatives and key disciplines that will give you insights into, um, into the potential hazards and whether or not there are weaknesses in the system. When you look at uh, the SEMS uh, section, uh, part 250, 
uh, Section 1911, the, the things that they looked at is they wanted to have all types of offshore structures that were permanently or temporarily attached to the seabed included, and also Department of Interior regulated pipelines. The key types of hazards analysis requirements that they wanted to put forth, that they wanted to use, are facility level hazards analysis, and there are a variety of techniques identified for that, and also job safety analysis. I'll be focusing on the facility level hazards analysis, and Matthias will be focusing on the job safety analysis. Uh, other key clarifications that are provided in the SEMS uh, regulations are that analysis and documentation must be maintained for the life and, uh, of the operation of the facility. Um, you can take applicability to similar systems and processes. If you have a number of platforms with the same kind of system, you can take a good thorough analysis of one and validate it for others. Uh, the other requirements are you must uh, complete the analysis by November 15th this year, 2011. And you also must periodically update the hazards analysis at the same time as the performance of the compliance audit. And, and you also have to uh, do the job safety analysis uh, to complete it and get it approved prior to the commencement of work. So these are key clarifications of the application of Recommended Practice 75, which is directly referenced by the, SEM, the SEMS requirements 30 CFR Part 250. Uh, other clarifications on the facility level hazards analysis techniques. Actually, it looks like we skipped one here. Okay, are that um, the hazards analysis techniques must be appropriate to the complexity of the operation and must identify, evaluate, and manage the hazards involved in the operation. And referencing 14J identifies several methods as acceptable. Uh, what if checklist has and operability studies, failure modes and effects analysis, fall tree analysis, or another methodology that you validate as being acceptable are all valid methods for applying and addressing the hazards analysis requirements of, uh, or the facility level hazards analysis requirements of SEMS. And when you uh, are a practitioner and do these things frequently, you'll realize that different types of the process uh, really beg the use of different tools. So you may, for complex portions of the study, use a hazard and operability study, and a what-if checklist for more simpler parts of that that would deal with human factors issues or various siting issues. Uh, one of the other things I'll be talking about a little bit, too, is the uh, API Recommended Practice 14 and doing a 14C review. Those are things that can also be helpful here, too. So when you're looking at the different facility-level hazard analysis techniques, uh, you want to make sure that they address the hazards of the process, they address previous incidents, engineering and administrative controls, a lot of people refer to those as safeguards, and make sure you have a qualitative evaluation of the consequences. Basically, impact on safety, impact on health, impact on the environment, equipment, and you're looking at the fa failure of those controls as leading to those potential consequences. Human factors also have to be addressed, and they're also addressed via the job safety analysis. Uh, there also has to be a system to promptly address team findings and recommendations, and a key objective for all these things is quality. Doing a good job and making sure that the hazards analysis is not only done thoroughly, but also can be easily updated. Uh, to put together a good thorough hazards analysis, uh, you need a, a good team that provides you with this goal for understanding the nature of hazards at a facility and making uh, decisions on whether there are vulnerabilities, and maybe even coming up with suggestions on how to address those vulnerabilities. Uh, the team, as, re uh, as identified in Recommended Practice 75 and endorsed by SEMS, must be made up of representatives from engineering, operations, and pulling in other specialties as needed. And it also must include a person with knowledge and experience specific to the process, and also knowledge and experience in the hazards analysis methodology. Do you have to use a third-party contractor like risk management professionals? No. You have every authorization to do it internally, do it using your own resources, and we'll talk to you later about how to do that effectively, but you definitely want somebody who knows how to run a hazards analysis and do documentation that's effective and useful. Uh, a couple of clarifications on job safety analyses that are provided by SEMS is that you have to uh, have the most recent job safety analysis that kept on at the job site, and it must be readily accessible to employees. The JSA must identify, analyze, and record the different job steps, 
existing or potential safety and health hazards, and also identify any recommended actions that may eliminate or reduce the hazards and um, the potential for risk at the workplace for injury or illness. And you also have to have an individual approve the JSA prior to work commencement. And as I mentioned before, uh, Matthias will be providing a lot more background information on JSAs. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the different hazards analysis techniques. Uh, we'll start with the facility level hazards analysis. Key common elements for all analyses are that they have to identify hazards to the process, to the chemicals, to operations, and also identify external events that could affect the facility. You have to identify the risk to life, health, environment, and property, as we mentioned before, list the worst case consequences, identify what safeguards are in place, and make sure that there's an effect objective method to put all this out, have the right people there who can make decisions, understand and identify whether the safeguards are effective or if additional safety features are needed. These are all common elements to an effective hazards analysis process. I had mentioned a few that were specifically endorsed or mentioned by API Recommended Practice 14J. It's important to realize that different tools are, can be applied to different, for different purposes and different applications. For simple job steps, you may do a job safety analysis that's specifically mentioned in, a, uh, in the SEMS requirements, 30 CFR Part 250. Uh, on the simple end of this entire end of the hazards analysis spectrum are what if checklists and also uh, hazard identification. Tip people typically refer to it as a hazard approach. At the very complex end, very powerful tools that give you more insights but allow for risk quantification are, are uh, fault tree analysis, event tree analysis, layer protection analysis, and bow tie. These are tools that allow you to quantify hazards and make decisions on re equipment reliability if need be. In the middle in green, and it's not coincidental that they're in green, are the more commonly used techniques for offshore facilities. Jobs safety analysis, uh, a 14C review, failure modes, failure modes and effects analysis, and one of the powerhouses or most powerful tools in terms of bang for the buck, if used properly, is a hazard operability study. And for the facility level hazards analysis, we'll be focusing on HAZOP for our little um, explanation and example. The one thing to keep in mind is these tools provide higher complexity, higher effort on the right side, uh, lower complexity, low effort, fewer insights on the left side. So you want to match the tool to the need. For example, if you're looking at a continuous process, the hazard operability study is really the workhorse of the industry, the HAZOP. If you're lo looking at resolve a decision for equipment reliability or one design application versus another, uh, layer protection analysis or some risk quantification technique can be very helpful. Another one that kind of um, helps segue from the actual analysis to application is a bow tie. Tie is a very good analytical tool, and it's also used to help manage the degree of safety at facilities. And if you need to know more about that, I, I uh, suggest you check our website. There's a very good webinar on, on bow tie assessments. So we'll be focusing on uh, some of the core elements that, in the more common applications, JSA and HAZA. Okay, so comparing these different techniques, what a checklist straightforward, structured, but it's fairly restrictive with respect to the new ideas that you can come out uh, that can come out of it. You're essentially using a checklist of insights that people have had in the past, and you're using that that specific process. You're not as likely to identify new potential hazards. It is easier to use. You do, do need fewer resource requirements, but you get a fairly minimum level of information. And it's, it's easy to miss things because you're only using a checklist of insights that people have come up with before. Uh, 14J even clarifies it in black and white. Checklists do not provide a creative format for identifying or evaluating new hazards where previous experience is lacking. So it's critical that you're using that, that, that you realize that you've got that previous experience that's the basis for the checklist. Uh, the hazard operability study, as I mentioned, is the workhorse for these kind of activities. It's a deductive method. It's one of the most effective hazard identification techniques. Uh, it can provide a comprehensive investigation of potential hazard and operability problems. And also, when we apply it, we tend to adjust the level of detail to the complexity of the problem. Very complex scenarios, we'll put some more detail in there. 
so people can get some more information. And we also make prolific use of tag numbers and other reference points so it can be easily updated in the future. So that versatility really provides a lot of benefit to good applications of the hazard and operability study. You can also structure it, if you're careful, when you're applying the HAZOP, so that it can be readily um, used as a basis for layer protection analysis or other quantitative techniques. Uh, as I mentioned, FMECA and also failure modes and effects analysis are other tools that are applied. They are inductive. They're, they can provide a good identification of single failures. They're fairly straightforward, but they're less effective for the identification of multiple failures or events that are, that are happening at the same time. And again, as I mentioned before, typical applications for the various hazard analysis techniques are the use of multiple tools for a given process. Again, what you're trying to do, and you don't want to lose sight on the objective, is focus on vulnerabilities, identify if there are weaknesses in the system, and if there are improvements needed. Uh, this is a list for your reference of desirable information, things that you want to have. This dovetails with the safety environmental information or the SEI element of SEMS that ought to be done or key elements need to be done before doing the hazards analysis. So let's look at a simple uh, HAZOP study example just to illustrate what it is we're talking about. Here you're looking at a high pressure vessel on level control connected to a low pressure portion of the process. Uh, the low pressure portion of the process has 2% capacity relief valves. And the objective, if you've got this at your facility, is to use HAZOP approach to try to identify what kind of hazard scenarios can occur, what are the safeguards associated with that, and are there any vulnerabilities. So when you're taking something like that, which is uh, what you're looking at was a simplified PNID, and that's an, a, a description or, or a depiction of how a system operates. What the HAZOP is trying to do is do a model that depicts how it can fail. By understanding how it can fail, you can identify are there vulnerabilities or improvements needed. So the key methodology basis for the HAZOP study is that portions of the system are designed for a specific design intent. When you're operating within that design envelope, the potential for hazard and operability problems is minimized as long as that design was done correctly. So what you're looking at for the HAZOP study is a outside that design envelope, and you're trying to approach it systematically and, and look at deviations outside that design envelope, challenge the system, you know, basically break it as part of the, the team exercise, and then identify, as you're challenging it, are the safety features in place that are your barriers be between that initiating event and the ultimate consequences, are those barriers effective, are they adequate, or are there vulnerabilities where improvements are needed? So that's the key thing you're trying to do with the HAZOP study. Um, it's very systematic, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, yes, I did, huh? Okay, very good. Okay, this is the uh, deviation matrix that you typically apply for the HAZOP study. As I mentioned before, you're trying to look at deviations outside the design envelope. So you typically combine uh, operating parameters such as flow, temperature, pressure, level with guide words such as no and more. So you're trying to identify scenarios that can cause a loss of flow, increases in flow, increases in pressure, decreases in temperature, and look at what the impacts are. As I mentioned before, the HAZOP is very systematic, and you, this flow chart basically identifies the overall process. You define a section or a node, look at deviations within that node, potential causes within, uh, that are associated with that deviation. Causes can be things like valve failures, uh, tube ruptures, uh, operator take, all those can be causal events that can lead to potential problems. So you identify potential consequences associated with the cause, those safeguards that are the barrier between the causal event and those consequences, and then you cycle through the whole thing. With the key objective of the HAZOP study is not just an exercise to, to do some documentation that you want to submit to the BOEMRA, but it's really something that's designed to help flush out potential vulnerabilities and give you a basis for making decisions whether your design's adequate or whether improvements are needed. Uh, documentation results that are typically coming out of that is, uh, you, is tabular, where you're trying to lay out the scenario, and this is an example based on the little system that we just looked at, where your causal event is for, for one scenario, the level control valve malfunctioning open, 
and you might have some reset, maybe a controller failure, or even the bypass valve opening that causes the same effect. Consequences here can be gas blow-by to a low-pressure system. You rank that, identify what safeguards are in place, and if those safeguards have any dependency or common mode failure on things that can cause that can cause the event to start in the first place. In this case, you want to recognize that the level transmitter and level controller that can initiate the event and also compromise one of the safeguards. So you want to consider that, make sure it's clearly laid out, and that's really what the HAZUP study is all about, and that's what you're trying to do for the facility hazards analysis. So when you, um, when you apply these things, what we recommend is that you do the facility level hazards analysis first. Look at the design, how robust is the design? So when you're, when you're addressing your SEMS hazards analysis requirements, you want to look at the facility level hazards analysis first. You want to use one of the techniques that are endorsed as uh, readily applied, a, a modified 14C review, we'll talk about that shortly, and also we've got a webinar coming up on that. Uh, a HAZOP study approach, uh, most of you have tuned into it with us before, know that we have an ongoing has up study facilitation series uh, to help people with good applications of has up studies. So you want to use a what if checklist, modified 14C, or a has up study to help uh, address this facility level hazards analysis. You want to use a subset of that facility level hazards analysis team for the JSA. Use the core of the operating procedures after you've worked through the design as part of the facility level hazards analysis for doing the JSA review. However, as the SEMS requirements identifies, all OCS activities identified or discussed in the SEMS program should be addressed as part of the JSA. And so if a hazard was thoroughly addressed in the facility level J uh, hazards analysis and you've already addressed it, then simply reference that in the JSA. So here's a good way to help segue those two different activities so you're not doing the same job twice. So to provide some additional information on JSAs, what I'd like to do, do is introduce one of our uh, engineers who does a lot of work on offshore facilities and events programs, and he's going to talk to you about job safety analysis. Oh, here's Steve. Can I get your mic? Actually, I think, I think it's, uh, let's try this. Okay. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Can you hear me? Okay. So job safety analysis, JSA. As part of the uh, SEMS requirement, hazards analysis, as Steve mentioned, um, it's important to note as JSA that this is not new. It's been around. Uh, it's been an industry standard. Um, I've seen it used many times. And uh, now it is required. So there's no more you know, maybe we should do this. This is, it has to be done and it's enforced. We have the uh, regulation up there, 250-1911B, and um, some parts of the JSA uh, that are pretty even to know is that all activities in the SEMS program require a JSA, operating procedures, maintenance procedures, et cetera. They need to be readily accessible. The JSAs need to identify specific job tasks, hazards associated with that task, and the control measures in place to reduce or eliminate the hazard. Also important to note is that JSAs, they need to be reviewed, they need to be approved, and they need to be signed off before any work can be commenced on that operating procedure or that maintenance procedure. Um, moving forward. So what is a job safety analysis, a JSA? JSA should uh, integrate safety and health principles with specific job tasks. They must identify each basic step of a job and the hazards associated with that specific task. Also, they can include environmental equipment has a more comprehensive analysis. Uh, I want to single out environmental there specifically for something that doesn't always get taken into consideration is if you're working on a platform that is known for 40 to 50 mile an hour winds regularly or just dust of wind that can suddenly happen like that, that's something that if you have a pre-JSA meeting, pre-operating pre, uh, task procedure meeting, you want to probably incorporate that, speak about that, so you can think about something that's overlooked. People tend to look at the hazardous 
it's obviously a task if you're working at elevations, et cetera. Uh, but they could overlook something like, you know, if I'm getting a 50 mile hour gust of wind all of a sudden, that's something you probably want to think about. You want to probably tie off. Um, things, things like that. Also, night ops, working at night, lighting, things you want to take into consideration, uh, but those are special cases. Also, JSA should list the safety measures or procedures in place to mitigate those hazards. So once you identify the task, um, the potential hazard consequence, uh, you want to identify some safeguards to mitigate from that ever occurring moving forward. Continuing on what is the JSA. JSA should be used to determine the safest way to perform a certain task. Um, all, uh, excuse me, all operations, particularly special operations or operations performed by contractors, must have a JSA prior to commencing work. Again, specific ops, uh, you bring on a contractor, you need to have a JSA in place. Also, if the contractor that you bring on board with you has a JSA for a certain task and you at your facility have also a JSA for a certain task, which is the same task you might be performing, you need to sit down, you need to review that JSA and make sure that the most strict and accurate one is used. You want to use the most stringent one always. Uh, also, each day when you're having your meeting, you want to include JSAs for the task for that day. So if I'm going out that day and you're going to do some crane operations, um, some specific, I should say, crane operations for that day that are unusual, you want to sit down, you want to review the operating procedure, you want to review the JSA, make sure that the hazards are listed out and make sure that some, you know, safety designations are given to someone to watch over and make sure that a responsibility is designated uh, and that someone can look over and make sure that these, these safeguards are implemented while this task is being performed. Benefits of a job safety analysis. Benefits are discussing the task with a group of experienced workers provides further insight into the task and may identify previous undetected hazards. It increases the job knowledge and of those people participating it includes safety and health awareness. Lisa brings it up once again, lets everybody know about the safety and health awarenesses that people need to be aware of these, these issues. Uh, it increases communication between workers and supervisors. Uh, acceptance of safe work practices, procedures promoted, strengthens overall safety culture among facility personnel. Bottom line what this is saying is that it encourages communication. That's probably the best way I can describe a JSA. The biggest benefit is it encourages communication between the operators. Uh, your management personnel, any other safety personnel, you talk about it. Uh, it shouldn't just be one guy that's been there for 30 years with all this experience, you know, just spewing all this stuff out saying this is the way it should be done. It should be a group effort, uh, encourage communication amongst everybody. That's how you identify the hazards, uh, consequences, and the safeguards. Four basic steps of a JSA. Selecting the job to be analyzed, breaking the job down into a sequence of steps, identifying potential hazards, determining prevention measures to overcome these hazards. This is very specific to, like Steve mentioned earlier, ASOP methodology. Um, if anybody's ever been a part of a PHA, a process hazard analysis for a PSM or an RMP program, uh, same, same process. You're identifying a hazard uh, in the process, or in this case, the operating procedure. You're identifying a hazard, you're listing potential consequences or hazards, and then you are uh, delegating, I mean, excuse me, identifying safeguards to mitigate those. So as, uh, to give a hypothetical or an example here, uh, say we're painting a 20-foot high vessel on a platform. Uh, so we've identified the job to be analyzed. We need to paint this, this uh, vessel. Breaking it down the sequence of steps, step one, step one might be, all right, we got to erect some scaffolding so we can reach to get all sides of this thing. So we're going to be working in elevation. So now to identify a potential hazard of working at that elevation, you could fall off of it or you could drop me you talking with on somebody walking by. So there's some potential hazards. Uh, falling off of something even, even something five to 10 feet tall, uh, tall on a platform can be pretty brutal. Uh, if you've been out there, you know what I mean. You're talking steel grating everywhere, sharp corners. Uh, there's nothing to break your fall. So there's some hazards identified. I mean, a triple ball can get pretty ugly. So if you're at 15 to 20 feet, you definitely want to have something in place. So determining prevention measures to overcome these hazards. So we've identified our hazards, falling off, dropping things on someone. Uh, so what we want to do is uh, some prevention measures. You want to probably tie off. Uh, you don't want to fall down, you know, hit the ground, it's going to hurt, or the platform is going to hurt. You don't want to fall on somebody. And then uh, you probably want to rope off the area. You don't want to drop your equipment, your tools on someone else. So there's the four basic steps 
and an example, pretty simple example. However, this could be laid over to more complex systems and operating procedures. Here's example job safety analysis. Um, this might not look like the one you have at your facility, but it's pretty generalized, pretty standard to follow this. They get more complex. I've seen some that are more complex. Um, one thing you might want to add to this, uh, aside from job steps, potential hazards, and recommended safe uh, job procedures, is maybe add another column for responsibility so you can designate responsibility to a certain individual to ensure that someone is delegated to that, that mitigation system um, is, or that control system is implemented and in place. Here's a more complex uh, job safety analysis. This JSA includes a risk ranking. So risk ranking is a good thing to incorporate uh, because a lot of times if you've been a part of a hazard assessment or a PHA, you'll have some, some people identify a potential uh, hazard and a consequence, and then you want to put a kind of likelihood to it, and they're just like, you know, this this will never happen. This is not going to occur. Let's just move forward. So you don't want it, you want that to happen. You want people to think in there like that and say this could not happen. You want to risk rank it, even something basic, assign a number val uh, value to it to keep it out of their hands, keep it objective, and that way, you know, you can just rank it. You get your worst case scenario, your likelihood, you get a ranking, and then that way you can uh, delegate accordingly and, and, and fill out your, your JSA that way. Much better than they're talking about it, but either way, it works. I just prefer this method and would suggest this method. Safety alerts related to JSA. Okay, this is safety alerts issued by the Gulf of Mexico off uh, OCS region. <clears throat> and these are actual incident investigation results and comments made by uh, BOE MRE, BOMER, formerly MMS. These are actual, these are, these are very informational. These are available on the internet. Uh, I'm not going to go over all of them. We have, I think, four or five in this presentation They're in the, in the slides that you should have. If you don't have them, let me know. I'll get you a copy of it. Um, but these are good to look over. I highly suggest you review them. This is able to learn from someone else's mistakes, which, you know, I know we all learn from our personal mistakes better than from our successes, but let's try not to make mistakes and learn from someone else's. Uh, one specific one I'll just pull out of the next five pages is at the bottom of this page. A job safety analysis JSA was prepared by one of the mechanics. However, the JSA did not identify the site-specific hazards and only addressed diagnosing the fuel air management system problem. The JSA did not address the disconnection of the starter exhaust pipe. So, this brings to the comment of a site-specific JSA should be conducted and accurately reflected for the job at hand. Additionally, when the scope of work changes, the JSA has to be reviewed and changed accordingly with that procedure that you have in place. So don't take an old GSA um, for uh, you know an, an operating procedure that might be too general or too vague at the time. You want to review it, update it, make sure the JSA follows that, and then you want to move accordingly. Get it reviewed, signed off, and then work on the project. So we have a couple here. I'll skip through these. Safes, and we'll go to key points made by Bomer as result of investigation. These are basically lessons learned, if you will, once again from someone else's mistakes. So, a JSA should be conducted to identify all potential hazards, the potential consequence with necessary mitigation or precautions. Excuse me. Precautions. <clears throat> and precautions. Specific consideration should be given to potential sources of release and ignition points. Uh, those are probably bigger points, especially on a platform. Always pay specific attention and more detail to sources of ignition. Um, this also, I want to bring up that you can, once again, you can use an existing JSA uh, for an operating procedure. However, you do want to review it and you want to ensure that the steps, the hazards, and the controls are still acceptable for the job at hand. So again, you can use an old JSA, however you want to review it, make sure that it's up to date, that it's still applicable, and that it follows smoothly and specifically with that procedure. The JSA process should be used to review the site-specific detailed job steps and uncover hazards associated with the specific job undertaken. Site-specific JSAs should be conducted to accurately reflect the job at hand. When the scope of work changes, the JSA should be reviewed and changed accordingly. Once again, scope of work changes, review the JSA, make sure it's, it's accurate. Global pre-job safety meetings where the written JSA form was not completed and signed by all parties until post-accident is not acceptable. Um, if you have a meeting before a specific job task that day, 
you're supposed to review the JSA. If it's a specific job task that you're doing once a month, it's not frequent, it's not a regular operation, you're going to want to meet to discuss the operating procedure, the tasks at hand, and the JSA, because the JSA, you once again reiterate, hey, maybe this guy's been doing a specific job task, you know, a routine one, and this is not specific, this is, and this is specific, but this is not routine. You're going to want to bring up to him again, hey, don't forget, you know, the JSA, we itemize these hazards. You want to make sure he's aware of those hazards. You don't want to just have a little meeting with the guy, Hey, we're on the crane today. Don't hit anything. You don't want to do it that way. You want to make sure that you review it, have the meeting prior to the task. Most, operation, uh, most operators' uh, health, safety, and environmental, environmental policies require the need for a written JSA and pre-job safety meetings before a new job at the beginning of each workday and in the event of a significant operational change. Additional lessons learned. Um, again, this is where some people made mistakes. Just a couple bullets I want to pull out of there. Uh, inadequate JSA examples included, but are not limited to. Job tasks are vague rather than specific. The JSA does not include importance in the task sequence. The JSA does not address the task of specific job functions individually or the methods used to communicate and coordinate their tasks. JSA meeting should make the assignment of responsibilities clear. Again, meetings, specific tasks, specific operating procedure, it's all talking specifics. Um, these are pulled out of the sheets I showed you earlier and the additional uh, incident investigations performed by MMS. Uh, okay, um, this is a specific quote actually taken out uh, from Bomer from the, from the incident investigation again. The supervisor should always have uh, hold a fully attended comprehensive JSA meeting prior to major operations. These meetings should address all the steps in the upcoming operation, not just the major elements. All supervisors have the responsibility of communicating and understanding the unambiguous chain of command during upcoming operations. Final points, a formal review process for determining which jobs require JSA need to be developed. Some people, uh, or I should just say, some personnel on this day are not aware of what specific tasks require JSA. This should be made clear to everybody so everyone knows which requires a JSA, all, all SEMS related operating and major, uh, maintenance procedures, heavy crane operations, they all are going to require JSA, but everybody should be aware of these. Another quote, leases are reminded that site-specific pre-job training, JSAs, safety meetings, et cetera, and open communications are critical elements of the successful outcome of all job tasks. Operators ensure that experience and accountable supervision is supplied by all contractor crews and that proper procedures, including positioning of the personnel during critical operations and review in a JSA meeting prior to conducting operations. Um, basically, to tie this all together, you, if you were to look back on these, you probably realize that we, we mentioned on several slides the same things, specific job tasks, identifying hazards, consequences, uh, mitigation, uh, what else? That if an operating procedure changes, if the scope of work changes, you need to review the, J the JSA, revalidate it, reapprove it, sign it. Um, what else? Um, communication is key. That's, this shouldn't just be, now that it's required, it shouldn't just be a checklist that you fly through and, oh man, I got to get this done because it's regulation. The process is important. Uh, communication is what it promotes, and this is an overall good thing for the safety of everyone that's working on the platform. Um, Anything else? Uh, I believe that's that's all for JSA. Uh, now I'll move forward to API standards and guidebooks. Hand it back to Steve. Not a problem, Steve. My pleasure. Matthias, thank you very much. And uh, what I'd like to do is go ahead and follow through, talk about some of the uh, ancillary guidance documents and activities that, and resources that are available to you. I'd like to start with API standards and guidebooks. Recommended Practice 75, as I mentioned before, is a fundamental reference point for the safety and environmental management system requirements of 30 CFR Part 250. Uh, 75 was developed, as I mentioned, as a, uh, as a industry guidance document, and it was designed uh, for a, a initial response to put together the safety and environmental management program concept in 1991. Uh, it's been updated several times. It's on its third edition right now. It applies to drilling and production facilities and includes 12 key elements. Again, as I mentioned before, there's more in common than there is different between the, safe, the various safety management system documents, API recommended practice, being, recommended practice 75 being one of them. 
and it's the sort of thing that does make sense for application for offshore facilities and is a fundamental element of SIMS. Uh, other key guidance documents, and there's a number of other references at the end of our presentation that I'll share with you. Recommended practice 14J, if you're not already aware of them, you should. Uh, 14 say, 14 is associated with the design, installation, and testing of basic surface safety systems for offshore production platforms. It provides design examples, key examples of what kind of safeguards should be in place, and doing a 14C review can be a core element of addressing the facility hazards analysis. And as I mentioned before, the HAZOP study is more robust. The HAZOP study is specifically referenced by recommended practice 14J. So if you're using, if you've done a 14C review, you want to go ahead and look at potential, the need for potential enhancements, potential updates, potentially making it more complete. And an upcoming webinar will be addressing those specific items of how to morph a 14C review into addressing these SIMS hazards analysis requirements. Okay, 14J, another key guidance document. That gets into the details of the analytical techniques for the design and hazards analysis for offshore production facilities. So it's a key guidance document for what technique to use when and gives you a little bit more background on the techniques. And as we close things out, I'll show you how to get those references. Um, there's a number of other techniques, as I mentioned before. Different tools can be used in different, for different applications. What I want to talk about is where we're at with respect to offshore facility design and when you might want to use certain tools. Uh, as I mentioned before, there's more in common than not. When you're looking at understanding uh, hazard scenarios so you can identify if there are weaknesses in your system and vulnerabilities that need to be addressed, just looking at how likely something is to occur doesn't tell you the whole picture. Just because something happens frequently, if there's not much to it or if it's just a minor operational issue, it may not be all that important. Similarly, just looking at consequences, very high consequence events that are really not credible, they're not ever going to happen, really aren't also aren't all that important. So it's by looking at the likelihood and the severity of key events or key event key hazard scenarios that gives you an appreciation for the importance of the event and you can make decisions, effective decisions, on whether or not you've got vulnerabilities in your system. So all that revolves, all of these things, all these techniques revolve around that understanding. Some people, I threw this in there because a lot of people are used to looking at risk ranking matrices, same concept. You're trying to take scenarios and you look at frequency of the event, severity of the event, and you're using it to get, gauge risk and make decisions. Well, one of the things to keep in mind are that there have been a number of different, there are a number of different vintages of control and protection systems out at offshore facilities. Over the years, uh, a few decades ago, pretty much everything was an analog device, single element, for, usually fairly simple. And over the years, with the uh, red, ready availability of electronics, the ability to separate control and protection systems, adding redundancy, diversity to the system, putting in voting logic, all those things provide an ability to have enhanced protection features, but you're going to have a mix of those at any given facility. At the high end, you've got uh, guidance documents that provide, and some of them are listed on the screen for your reference, that are designed to provide you with an idea of reliability of some of your SIS or HIP systems, and use that to help identify are they adequate or not. When you're looking at the evolution of these things over the years from single element analog devices to more modern systems, there are various guidance documents in place that help you identify the reliability that apply to these different systems. And also down at the bottom of the screen, you've also got a relationship between that reliability and what they refer to as SIL levels for safety instrumented systems. The important thing to remember is that all of these different protection features whether they be simple analog devices or more modern uh, fault tolerant electronics, they all have reliabilities associated with them. So when you're looking at hazard scenarios and safeguards, you want to gauge the reliability associated with those specific uh, devices. Don't discount 
analog devices just because they're not rated as HIPS or SIS features, but include that with an overall understanding of the likelihood of the event as you move forward through your, your hazards analysis. The HAZOP technique, if done properly, can help you give you good insights to that. And also what I wanted to do is talk about layer protection analysis. Local was originally as a bridge between a very detailed, very expensive, of course, quantitative risk assessment and the, the workhorse of a HAZOP study. The HAZOP study gives you a lot of good insights, lays out the scenario, but it is a generally qualitative understanding of risk. So you're trying to take that qualitative understanding and as necessary, by some question of the adequacy of key safety features. So LOPA uses a relatively standard initiating cause frequencies, standard IPLs, and, and to, uh, standard uh, probabilities of failures on demand to keep the analysis simple, but to give you some good basic quantitative results to enhance your, your understanding of the system. Uh, LOPA usually is represented as a ratio of what is the desired uh, target frequency versus what is the frequency of the scenario. The desired target frequency, of course, is associated with the risk level that you want to achieve. And the frequency of the scenario is associated, is a function of the initiating cause, that initiating event frequency, uh, with the uh, unavailability of the independent, uh, independent protection layers. Unavailability typically represented as probability of failure on demand. So it's by comparing your actual scenario frequency to what to the mo the highest frequency that you'd want for that low consequence that gives you an idea of the adequacy of your safety systems, and that that can be represented as a LOPA ratio. And again, you're using LOPA to help understand the system, provide some basic quantification, and to decide if things are adequate. Uh, they typically will characterize the slope ratio and characterize it and associate it with a safety integrity level. The safety integrity level is a design feature. Allocating a safety integrity level target or allocating a SIL target can come out of your basic LOPA analysis or basic HAZOP study, so you can then characterize what reliability you want out of your protection features. Once the protection features are designed, usually still verification. So in summary, this layer protection analysis, which is also a very good tool, if applied to complex scenarios where you have uh, tough decisions to make, that LOPA tool can be very useful for a selective application to determine if risk targets are met, the adequacy of your basic process control systems or your SIS or HIPS protection features, helping you do a benefit cost analysis associated with various improvements, identified if if risk gets, can be achieved with lower pedigree systems rather than very high-end fault-tolerant electronics, and also identify those SIL allocation targets for this or HIPS features. Uh, when we do a layer protection analysis, usually we'll do it in conjunction with the hazard and operability study. A lot of people do them separately, but we, what we found is the LOPA gets a lot more expensive because you're having to reinvent or rediscuss the scenarios rather than as you're doing the HAZOP study, You've got the right team, and your your the understanding of the scenario is right there. Okay. Um, let's try something else. There we go. All right. If you press enough buttons, it eventually works. So let's talk about safety cases. As I mentioned before, there's other safety management system tools out there. A key uh, result of the Piper Alpha accident was the formulation of safety case requirements in 1992. And basically, these were for offshore ins installations initially, but they became, it became commonplace to adopt them for onshore facilities that dealt with highly hazardous materials. The original requirements focused on the things that went wrong for Piper Alpha, or the key things that went wrong for Piper Alpha. It included a fire risk analysis, looked at the risk of, or of ingress of smoke or gas into accommodations, if your platform has accommodations, looks at the ability of emergency systems to withstand severe accident conditions, again, a key outcome of the Piper Alpha tragedy, and looking at evacuation, escape, and rescue analysis. In 2005, they updated it to have early design notification and also a cycle to make sure safety cases were reviewed periodically and resubmitted. 
Uh, key elements of the safety cases were facility descriptions, the uh, health safety um, environmental management system, doing a formal safety assessment, looking at whether it's as low, uh, safety devices or the risk is as low as really practicable, and whether the facility is fit to operate. All these things are key parts of safety cases, and when you look at the tools applied on this slide, you're really looking at the same kind of uh, basic hazards analysis tools that we've been discussing. Bow tie, what if studies, JSA, failure modes and effects analysis, has up studies, has it fault tree analysis, et cetera. So again, all these different tools and techniques, there's more overlap than not. And this is illustrated in this slide. When you're really looking at the overall universe of quantitative risk assessment, your hazards analysis tools, HAZOP, what if, all tree analysis, FMECA, and HAZID, bow tie assessments, safety integrity level assessments, and layer protection analysis, all, all these overlap significantly, and it's, it's up to the experienced practitioner to choose a tool and uh, uh, use the tool where appropriate to get the kind of insights you want out of your analysis. So let's talk about when you're looking at safety environmental management systems and other safety management systems out there, similarities and differences. And the reason why I go through this is going to become clear in a couple minutes. When you're looking at SEMS, process management and risk management, key similarities are objectives, what you want to get out of the HEDS analysis, what methodologies are acceptable, uh, the methodology choice and level of detail, uh, adapting it commensurate with complexity and risk, same similarities, making sure people knowledgeable in the hazards analysis methodology are available, also personnel knowledgeable in design and operation. Our part documents, promptly addressing team findings and recommendations. If there's a, a key safety insight that comes out of a hazards analysis, you want to have a mechanism for making, making sure that it gets implemented in a streamlined fashion, or at least commensurate with the level of risk that it averts. All these things are similarities between these different programs that are out there, and a key thing is quality. When you're looking at the application of hazards analysis, the safety and environmental information, the team, the facilitator, methodology chosen, those are key elements that, form, uh, that are basis for your hazards analysis, and Understanding hazards is such an important fundamental element of SEMS that you want to make sure that quality is there. When you're contrasting SEMS to these other programs, um, the unique requirements of SEMS are the requirement for a supplemental job safety analysis. When you're looking at offshore facilities, if you contrast that to onshore, offshore facilities can have more stepwise activities that are closely tied to operating procedures, and so uh, there's a requirement for job safety analysis to complement the facility level hazards analysis. So when they put together SIMS, they recognize the element and specifically included JSA. And for those of you who are following our SIMS webinar series, uh, next week on, October, on August 25th, uh, same time, we'll be having a webinar that shows how to couple and integrate the job safety analysis producing a tool called ProSaint. Uh, it's a very unique application that helps you kind of kill two birds with one stone and provide a more robust JSA for addressing that portion of the hazards analysis and also operating procedures. Another unique requirement of SIMS when you contrast it to PSM and RMP is that you're revalidating and updating the hazards, and hazards analysis at the same time the compliance audit performance. When the regulators looked at PSM and RMP and the fact that there were different timelines and that caused confusion in some, in some cases. Uh, they realized that a three-year update interval starting on the second year after the initial SEMS program completion and synchronizing that with the compliance audit was a very good way to go. So when you look at SEMS versus these other regulations, you see mostly similarities with some differences that were put into 30 CFR Part 250 to address some specific deficiencies or enhancements that make it a little easier to manage. Now, so what do you do with that information? Let me, let me share with you some ideas on organizing an effective SIMS program. A lot of a lot to do by November 2011, 
which is the date of when you're supposed to have your hazards analysis completed, documented with an action plan in place for addressing recommendations. Since the bulk of safety management system elements are in common to other loss prevention programs like PSM and RMP, basically offshore companies that operate offshore facilities that also operate onshore facilities, you've probably got a lot of resources in your company that back, people with background in PSM and RMP RMP, basic procedures for incident investigation and management of change that you can tap in into. If you're one of those companies that has onshore resources where these onshore uh, other business units have to address PSM and RMP, because of those similarities, you can tap versus technology and experience to effectively address the SIMS requirements. I would encourage you to do so. Uh, we're practitioners, we're, we're engineering consultants that deal in all those different areas. The bulk of our work is PSM, RMP, and SEMS, and all the different applications associated with that, and hazards analysis and analyses are one of our specialties. And I can tell you that if you've got in-house resources that can provide those expertise and, and procedures and help you out, it'll really streamline the applications, make it much easier to manage, and also make it a lot easier to meet your November 15th deadline. Um, in terms of implementing SIMS altogether, basically you've got a really broad spectrum of activities. What you want to focus on is integrating these activities and minimizing duplication. You've got similar objectives for all these performance-based requirements. So using program overlaps to minimize duplication can be critical. You want to work towards a unified program. You want to start simple. Take your existing elements. Most of you have operating procedures of sorts. Perhaps you haven't updated them for a while or used them regularly, but you've got operating procedures. You may have MOC uh, procedures. Take what you've got, pull it together, and then do a gap analysis. Take a look and see if there are elements that are missing, things that, are, that need to be improved. And also, as necessary, update and enhance the completeness of, completeness of existing analyses you don't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel. You also don't necessarily have to call a consultant and say, just do my program from scratch. If you've got something that works, if you've got program elements and practices that function at your facility uh, that are consistent with managing safety at your facility, that's an excellent place to start. And again, November 15th is right around the corner. Uh, we encourage folks not to wait. Uh, you've got resources and you've got um, that, that are maybe available to you if you work ahead of time. You've got multiple departments and organizations that all have to be pulled together, so it's important that you get started with this stuff or move forward on this. What I also wanted is talk a little bit about current events, uh, things that have been happening recently. Uh, the Offshore Operators Committee, most of you are familiar with them. Uh, they're currently in the final stages of developing audit tool, and uh, it should, it, there have been versions out and I believe it's going to be finalized in, in almost imminently, that's going to be a very good tool to do a gap analysis and see if there are elements missing uh, for formulating your SEMS program. Also, earlier this year, the American Petroleum Institute sponsored the Center for Off Safety. Uh, it's a focus group focused on offshore safety, and SEMS is obviously a key element that most offshore facilities operating in U.S. waters have to address. The regulator, of course, BOEMRE, that's, as Matthias mentioned, is the descendant of the MMS. Uh, the ones who uh, restructured in 2010 into BOEMRE issued and promulgated SEMS as part of 30 CFR Part 250. And they're continuing to uh, look at the SEMS requirements. They're, they're thinking about an update that's supposed to come out this fall that provides uh, some additional uh, leverage on their end for fines if people don't do things. And uh, there's also some other uh, issues with respect to audits and, and their approval on the audit process. Uh, they're also restructuring, and in fact, the arm of the BOEMRE that, that most people will probably be addressing after October this year is called BSS, BSEE, or the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement. So that group will be a key, play a key role in uh, helping facilities implement SEMS. So what I want to do is uh, make the speakers available for questions. You guys can start thinking about your questions or posting them to our producer, Nicole Agramba. But while you're doing that, what I'd like to do is share with you some resources and references 
that might be helpful to you. Uh, this page, it might be a little tight for you to read uh, on the screen, but you have, that's why you've got a hard copy. This is a list of webinars that we've done uh, in recent months that provide insights, tips, and practical approaches for how to address many of the different elements of SIMS. And uh, we've got several more uh, training activities that are coming up. As I mentioned, August 25th, the, we're going to be highlighting the ProSaint software that can facilitate the integration of JSA and operating procedures and help actually create the operating procedures for offshore facilities. Um, also in October, we got two really good training activities uh, in our Irvine, California. The, the webinars are, of course, uh, at no cost. Uh, for things like our two-day bow tie risk analysis seminar, that's a uh, at cost uh, course that's going to be given in our Irvine, California training center. And on October 24th through 27th in New Orleans, we'll be uh, uh, sponsoring a, a four days on practical sims implement implementation and auditing techniques. Other free webinars coming up August 25th. Again, tune in next week for. For pros, we got tips for training, contractor safety management, and implementation of safe work practices. Uh, I mentioned the two October courses, and we've also got uh, in November another free webinar on incident investigation for SEMS. And in, on December 6th, we've got offshore facility emergency action plans, again, as a free webinar. Those are all resources available to you that hopefully will provide some insights based on our application of SEMS, SEMS tech. SEMS programs as part of our engineering consulting activities. Other resources available to you, these are some uh, areas on the web where you can get additional data. The BOEMRE site obviously has got a lot of background on enforcement and regulatory activities. Uh, RMPCorp.com and SEMS1.com are our websites that provide resources and background information, <coughs> excuse me, and links to our webinars. Um, SEMS1.com's SEMSresource.html page has a lot of good SEMS information that you can download. SEMS-solution.com is a, a, some background information on our SEMS compliance software. Uh, OilSpillsCommission.gov is the uh, reports and other items coming from the National Commission on the BP Deepwater Horizon Oil Spill and Offshore Drilling Results. Uh, and also API.org, I mentioned before the API recommended practices were available for download. Uh, they keep, well actually not download, but they're available for viewing the, uh, through the American Petroleum Institute that's made them available for, made key recommended practices for safety available to everybody for use for the general enhancement of safety at offshore facilities. I've also provided, I'm not going to go through them, references uh, to documents, uh, key things you can get off the web and key regulatory uh, um, guidance documents that you can go ahead and get access to. Most of these are available on our website. And since you had time to think about it, I'd like to just open it up for questions to either myself or Matthias. Matthias, would you like to join me? Yes. Ms. Trauma, no background information? Uh, no, no, no questions. All right. Did you have anything else you wanted to add on JSAs? Oh, okay, sorry. Anyhow, it looks like we're all set. And uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll look forward to um, your guys uh, joining us for our August 25th webinar. And if you have any questions, please feel free to call the number on your screen and uh, tell me you got a SEMS issue. And also, uh, please join us on, on LinkedIn. Uh, we've sponsored a uh, BOEMRE compliance page and other uh, pages that provide background information and just so just look us up. Thank you.